the way I'm going to do this is I'm actually going to start with uh, one of the principal objections from non-Catholics. I'm not going to dwell there because our apostolate is an apostolate to Catholics, but there is one particular um, way that we found to be very effective in addressing the principal beliefs of the non-believers who believe in evolution. And I'd like to share that with you. And then I'm going to proceed with the objections that we hear most often from Catholics who did not receive a traditional formation in the faith. And then as we go on, we'll get to the objections that those who have a more traditional formation raise against the traditional doctrine of creation and the traditional reading of Genesis. Now we heard from Brother Columba Maria how St. Peter, our first pope, warned us against the evolution revolution and inspired by the Holy Ghost, he predicted the premise precisely that undergirds every form of evolutionary thought, be it atheistic or theistic, when he said that scoffers will come into the church mocking the word of God in Genesis. He doesn't say that explicitly, but he says it implicitly. And their premise is all things have continued as they were from the beginning of creation. This is absolutely incredible that a man who ran a fishing business almost 2,000 years ago predicted the precise premise that is the foundation for every form of evolutionary thought that comes against God's revelation of how he created the world as it has been understood in his church from the beginning. And when we encounter the majority of our brothers and sisters, the children of Adam in the human race, virtually all of them have been thoroughly indoctrinated into this error. It's in the air that we breathe. And so virtually all unbelievers, at least in the Western world, are absolutely convinced that things have always been the same from the first moment of the universe, if there was a first moment. And that the same material processes that are going on now have been operating in more or less the same way from the very first moment when the universe came into existence. So this is their Achilles heel. If by the grace of God, we can sow a seed of doubt in the unbeliever's mind, about this principle, he is going to have some degree of openness after however many sleepless nights to the grace of God to consider the truth. And this is what we have found to be a very effective way to enter into a conversation with an unbeliever who's convinced of this uniformitarian naturalism. We can ask almost anybody who has even a rudimentary public school education here in the US. Isn't it interesting that every living thing is full of coded information? All unbelievers have been taught that. There's not going to be any argument there. Yes, that's, that's pretty interesting. Everybody knows that. But then we could say, well, did you ever consider the fact that in the field of information theory, it is an axiom that coded information only comes from an intellect, from an intelligence. And when you encode information, there not only has to be an intellect, there has to be a will, a free will. And you can give very, very simple examples. Imagine you have a number of grandchildren on a holiday 
and they go up to this attic to have fun and be away from all the adults, but they want to have a system whereby they can be warned if an adult is going to come up the stairs to check on them. So they invent the simplest possible code. One knock means dad, two knocks means mom, and you act accordingly. Even to establish that convention, you must have a mind and you must have a free will because it's only your free will that allows you to choose that one knock equals dad instead of two or three or standing on your head or some other convention. Brother Dr. Kevin Mark and I were in a debate with two atheists, which is on the modern day debates website. And we brought forward the argument in the opening that only an intelligence and a free will could produce the coded information that we find in all living things. And one of our atheist partners said, well, that's not true. Uh, it's not, you can't compare computer code to the code that's in living things. As if this was some kind of refutation of what we had said, but it completely missed the point. Whether it's computer code or DNA code, or the code that those little children invented in the attic of grandma's house, you have to have a mind and a free will to say that A is going to equal X and not Y, or Y and not X. So if your atheist interlocutor is open to the truth at all, you can bring him to the point where he will realize that it is impossible to explain the origin of any of the coded information in living things without it originating from an intellect and a free will, which obviously had to exist from the beginning in order to bring this biological information into existence. Now, this is also very important because if coded genetic information had to be created in the beginning, then uniformitarian naturalism is falsified. Think about it. Naturalism, uniformitarianism, is predicated on the premise that we can explain everything that we see and how it originated in terms of the same material processes that are going on now. But you just proved with the simplest of examples to your atheist interlocutor that that is false because there is no material process that is going on now that produces new functional information. It has never been observed in the laboratory or in nature. So naturalist uniformitarianism is falsified with this very simple example. And that means what had to exist in the beginning before any living thing was a mind and a free will that was capable of producing that coded information and instantiating it in the genetics of living organisms. It's no coincidence that this agrees perfectly with the dogma of creation as defined by the Roman Catechism, the Catechism of the Council of Trent. This is the definition of the dogma of creation as contained in the first article of the creed. This catechism was written for pastors to teach their illiterate people the dogmas of the faith. It was the gold standard for teaching and preaching the dogmas of the faith for 350 years. It's still authoritative. It's the only catechism that's quoted in the new catechism. It's quoted 20 times because it gives such beautiful 
precise formulations of all the dogmas. And this is defining the first article of the creed. So as St. John the Baptist was decapitated, when you deform the correct interpretation of the first article of the creed, you are decapitating the creed. And it's crystal clear in the Roman Catechism, the divinity created all things in the beginning. He spoke and they were made. He commanded and they were created. And when Vatican I defined that no one can change the formulation of any dogma because of the alleged progress of science, this catechism was the gold standard for teaching and preaching the dogmas of the faith. So nobody can say that we're free to go against this dogmatic decree, because this explanation of the dogma of creation, because Vatican I expected every Catholic in the world to understand that the dogma was defined in the Council of, in the Catechism of Trent at that moment, and that's what we have to hold fast to. And as Brother Columba Maria emphasized in that same catechism, St. Charles Borromeo and the other authors made a very clear distinction between the supernatural work of creation, which was finished on the sixth day with the creation of Adam and Eve, and the period of providence, the natural order, what we're living in, which only began when the entire supernatural work of creation was finished. And where do St. Charles Borromeo and the others refer the pastors to Exodus? Because it's in Exodus that God wrote in the tablet of stone with the finger of God, remember to keep the Sabbath holy because in six days, God created the heavens and the earth and the seas and all they contain and rested on the seventh day. Moving on to the objections of the less well catechized Catholic brothers and sisters, the Bible is only inerrant when it speaks of faith and morals. Well, no, Vatican I defined de fide that the Bible is inerrant in everything that it affirms, that God is the author. So this is very easy to refute. And as Father Brian Harrison and others have proven, even de verbum in Vatican II rightly interpreted does not contradict scriptural inerrancy with regard to everything that the sacred author affirms, whether it's in natural science, history, geography, or anything else. But the church was wrong about Galileo. I remember Father Wolf saying on a number of occasions that when he was a graduate student and studying uh, chemistry or some uh, area of physical science, he went to a meeting with some professors and graduate students, and the professors were disturbed because so many of their students still believed in this Genesis revelation, in this creationism. And so one of the professors said, bring up Galileo, that always shuts them up. And the sad reality is it does most of the time, but it shouldn't because the church wasn't wrong about Galileo. And as St. Robert Bellarmine pointed out to Galileo's party, from the time of King Solomon, the entire tradition of the people of God has maintained that the Bible teaches geostatic geocentrism. So in the time of St. Robert Bellarmine, there was a tradition more than 2,500 years old, continuous, that every time scripture spoke about anything regarding 
the relationship between the earth and the sun and the relative motion that it was the earth that was stationary and it was the sun that was moving in relation to the earth. And the magisterium has never abrogated its formal condemnations of heliocentrism in 1616 and 1633. Just ask your Catholic brother or sister, could you please show me where the teaching authority of the church at the same or a higher level of authorities has abrogated the decrees of 1616 and 1633, they will never be able to do it. And what's more, as Eric Birmingham will demonstrate during this week, the scientific evidence overwhelmingly supports the neo tyconian model of the universe, which is the very same one that was shown in visions to St. Hildegard of Bingen, doctor of the church, 500 years almost before the time of Galileo, which has the sun going around the earth and the planets going around the sun. But Moses didn't write Genesis. This is a very common objection. And yet the whole documentary hypothesis that was formulated more than 200 years ago was false from the start because it was based on the false premise that archaeologists had not found any evidence of writing in the time of Moses. Therefore, if there was no writing in the time of Moses, Moses couldn't have written in anything. Written anything. Sounds very logical. The problem is the premise is completely false. And as archaeologists continued their work, we found evidence of writing 1,000 years before the time of Moses. So this whole argument that Moses didn't write Genesis was, is entirely based on a premise that has been completely falsified. And we know, and there are many things that you could say to your Catholic theistic evolutionist brother or sister, but for example, Genesis is full of loan words that are brought into Hebrew from Egypt, the Egyptian language, much more than in any part of the Bible. Makes perfect sense if Moses was educated in the court of Pharaoh and Egyptian was probably almost his mother tongue, but it doesn't really make any sense at all otherwise. And there are forms of language in the Pentateuch and in specifically in Genesis that are not found in any other part of the Bible, which doesn't make any sense at all if the whole thing was cobbled together by some scribes during the Babylonian captivity. For example, the first prophecy of the Messiah in Genesis 3.15 uses a pronoun that has no gender. It's called an epicene personal pronoun. He will crush your head, she will crush your head, it will crush your head. The gender has to come from the verb, which is very unusual. And that epicene personal pronoun is only found in the first five books of the Bible. Makes no sense if those books were actually authored or put together by some scribes during the Babylonian captivity. But the most important argument that any Catholic with an ounce of piety left ought to be moved by is that God himself said, Moses wrote of me. You have to make our Lord Jesus Christ a liar if you do not accept that Moses was the principal author redactor of the sacred history of Genesis. But great theologians of the early centuries of the Christian era, like St. Augustine, they didn't read Genesis as history. It's only in the last hundred years, mostly in the United States, that you have people coming up 
with a radically different view. That's Dr. Ken Miller at Brown University. And the incredible thing about this statement is it is the exact opposite of the truth. What he should have said is, all the great theologians of the early centuries of the Christian era, including St. Augustine, read Genesis as history. It's only in the last hundred years that you have people coming up with a radically different view. That would actually have been an accurate statement because St. Augustine spoke for all the fathers and doctors when he wrote, quote, the narrative of Genesis is not written in a literary style proper to allegory, as in the canticle of canticles, but from beginning to end in a style proper to history as in the books of Kings. And if somebody tells you, well, nobody cared about the age of the earth, that was irrelevant. You could remind them that Venerable Bede, one of the greatest doctors in the entire history of the Catholic Church, was called a heretic to his bishop because he called into question the chronology derived from the Septuagint version of the Old Testament. In the Septuagint version, if you take the numbers and the genealogies, you get a chronology of approximately 5,200 to 5,500 years from creation to the birth of Christ. And that's reflected in the Roman martyrology reading for midnight mass in the traditional Roman rite. But Venerable Bede saw that St. Jerome was correct, that the numbers in the original Hebrew text were more reliable than the numbers in the Septuagint, and he proposed what became after Trent the absolutely standard chronology within the Catholic Church of 4,000 years from creation to the birth of Christ. And Dom Guéranger in the liturgical year, he's emphatic that that reading from the Roman martyrology is the only example in the entire Roman liturgy where anything other than the 4,000 years is presented in the liturgical prayers. Oh, but according to Genesis 1, the day the sun wasn't created on day four. You can't have days without the sun. Therefore, obviously, the days of Genesis cannot be literal days. It's mind boggling that even a scholar as brilliant and learned as Father Stanley Yaki, a master of theology and of natural science, actually used this argument to dismiss the entire patristic tradition on the interpretation of Genesis. And yet the entire tradition of the church teaches that God created the day on day one with 12 hours of light and 12 hours of darkness. And St. Thomas himself sums up this tradition in the Summa as follows, quote, the words one day are used when day is first instituted to denote that one day is made up of 24 hours. Hence, by mentioning one, the measure of a natural day is fixed, unquote. And as to why God waited until day four to create the sun, the fathers taught that this was so that anyone who held fast to God's Genesis revelation would know that the sun is a creature, that it is not the source of life, and thus they would never fall into idolatry, as did the Aztecs, as did the Egyptians, as did so many pagans who lost the original revelation handed down from Adam. Yes, but surely there are contradictions between Genesis 1 and 2. No, they're not. St. Augustine had an Im imperfect translation of the Hebrew text of Genesis in the Vetus Latina. In St. Jerome's translation, after he had learned Hebrew at the feet of the rabbis in Palestine, all those apparent contradictions completely disappeared. So, for example, in Genesis 2.8, it makes it seem as if God did things after creating Adam that he actually did before, but this is because Hebrew does not have all the tenses of Latin or Greek, 
and you have to understand from the context what the correct tense is. And so in Genesis uh, 2.19, in the not actually a Bible translation, it says, so the Lord formed out of the ground all the wild animals, which makes it seem as if he created the animals after he created Adam. Whereas the Dewey Rems Bible, which is a faithful word for word translation of the Vulgate, which is a faithful translation of the Hebrew, says, and the Lord God having formed out of the ground all the beasts of the earth. No contradiction whatsoever. But we should be so proud that Monsignor Lemaitre, a Catholic priest, invented the Big Bang hypothesis. This is where we can see how wrongheaded it is to think that all our problems began with Vatican II. Our problems began 200 years before Vatican II. Monsignor Lemaitre, 100 years ago, had already completely abandoned the creation providence framework in favor of the Cartesian naturalist uniformitarian framework. He completely rejected the entire tradition of the church and the unanimous teaching of the fathers and doctors on creation. And he rejected post Pope Pius XII's attempts to use the Big Bang hypothesis to support the Catholic doctrine of creation. And worst of all, the Big Bang is a totally bogus, bankrupt hypothesis, as Eric Birmingham will prove later on this week. Yes, but Pope St. John the Great taught that evolution is more than a hypothesis. Well, according to the dogmatic definition of papal infallibility of Vatican I, this gift is given to the Pope not to, quote, define any new doctrine, but only to define a doctrine of faith or morals that is contained in the deposit of faith handed down from the apostles. And needless to say, no modern pope has tried to find evolution or billions of years in the deposit of faith that was handed down from the apostles. And Brother Columba Maria has already explained that in their authoritative teaching, modern popes have actually taught things that if we were obedient would lead to the complete rejection of molecules to man evolution as a violation of fundamental principles of common sense. But the popes have allowed heliocentrism to be taught for 200 years and Big Bang cosmology and billions of years for a century. How is that possible if the traditional reading of Genesis is true? This is a very important question for us to be able to answer. And one of the things that faith in evolution does is it makes us have contempt for the past so we don't study history and that's where all the answers are contained. Because if you go back to the Old Testament and study the history of the period from King Solomon to the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, you'll find that they entered into a period of almost 1,000 years of collective amnesia with regard to Genesis. And this is why God only told us to remember one commandment. Remember that thou keep holy the Sabbath day because every other commandment is part of the natural law. You can look at nature and you can know that you should honor your mother and your father. But you cannot look at nature and know that God created the heavens and the earth and the seas and all they contain in six days. You will only know that if you obey God and you remember what he revealed. And from Solomon on, they didn't remember to the point where during the reign of King Josiah, they literally did not know 
that Genesis existed. It says in the word of God that the high priest Hilkiah stumbled upon the scroll of Moses written in the hand of Moses. They didn't even know that it existed. So this has been a problem for the people of God for thousands of years. It's nothing new. And so the answer is turn back, as Father Sean said, to where we went off the rails. And this collective amnesia continued until the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ himself. And you can prove that to any fair-minded person. Just ask any Catholic brother or sister. You know how many times the scribes, the Pharisees, asked Jesus questions about the law. How many times did they refer to Genesis? Wait for the answer. But the answer is zero times. This collective amnesia persisted even beyond the destruction of Jerusalem, which was a punishment for forgetting Genesis and not keeping the Sabbath. Because there is not one single time in the four holy gospels when any of the learned men reference Genesis, and yet God himself in answering them draws from the sacred history of Genesis to remind them of the truth. But God would be a deceiver if he made this world to appear billions of years old when it's only 6,000 years old. I'll never forget hearing that from Dr. Ken Miller in a debate with Henry Morris of ICR back in the 1980s or maybe even earlier. And it's a ridiculous claim. And a very good example to use is the first miracle that Jesus did when he changed the water into wine. If you could take a pint of that wine right after it had been created and you gave it to the best scientists and engineers who ever lived, given the best laboratory facilities, unlimited budget and 10 years, say, come back and tell us the true age and origin of this wine when we gave it to you. After 10 years, they'll be no closer to the right answer than they were when they started. Because there's only one way that anybody could know the true age and origin of that wine when it was served, and that is from the truthful witness appointed by God, St. John the Evangelist. And it is the same with the six days of creation. That's why our Lord wanted six containers of water, not five and not 10, but six because the only way that anyone can know the true age and origin of the heavens and the earth and the seas and all they contain is from the truthful witness Moses appointed by God as that testimony has been understood in God's church from the beginning. Yes, but how could light from distant stars reach the earth in 6,000 years? It's impossible. No, it's not impossible. As Eric Birmingham will explain, God Almighty devoted an entire day to creating the firmament, the rakia, which scientists came to call the ether medium, which fills the entire material universe and which is the medium that light travels on. And God revealed multiple times that he stretched out this ether medium so that light could be billions of light years away, but when it's traveling on a stretched out ether medium, it can reach the earth practically instantaneously. And NASA has to admit that the ether is a factor in light speed, as even Einstein had to do when he revised special relativity with general relativity, because NASA will tell you if you ask them that electromagnetic waves travel faster from east to west than from west to east, because they won't sell you this. The ether medium has to be added 
to the speed of light. It's C plus however fast the ether current is going, and the ether medium, the condition of it, will also determine the speed of light between any two objects. But doesn't radiometric dating prove that the Earth is billions of years old? No, it doesn't. We've already seen, and you can prove to anyone, that the premise of naturalism, uniformitarianism, is false. But then you can show them how its falsity is illustrated by radiometric dating. Because suppose we want to date a rock that contains a certain amount of radioactive uranium and a certain amount of lead. And we know that uranium decays into lead in an eight step sequence at a certain rate as measured in the laboratory today. Now, if we know that it would take 1.2 billion years to produce the amount of lead that I have in my rock, by uranium to lead decay at the rate of decay that we observe in the laboratory today. Therefore, we can be certain, rock solid certain, that this rock is 1.2 billion years old. Right? Wrong. Because of the assumptions that we have made. Number one, that we knew how much uranium and lead were in the rock material to begin with. Can we get in a time machine and go back 1.2 billion years and examine the material? Of course we can't. It's a ridiculous assumption. Number two, that we know that the rate of uranium to lead decay has remained constant for the entire 1.2 billion years. That's another absurd assumption. We have massive evidence that there was accelerated radioactive decay at least at one point in Earth's history, probably during Noah's flood. And number three, we would have to assume that the material that forms this rock was somehow miraculously preserved in isolation from the environment for 1.2 billion years. Utterly ridiculous. Uranium is water soluble. Are we supposed to believe that for 1.2 billion years, no water ever came in and took uranium out or brought it into the system? Utterly unverifiable and totally absurd. And so we have numerous examples of where rocks of known age have been dated with various forms of radiometric dating methods and rocks of known age were found to be millions of years old when the actual rocks had been formed just 20, 50, 100 years ago. And I don't have time to go into all those examples, but I do want to give you one very helpful point while we're in this realm that you can use to get your Catholic brothers and sisters who have been indoctrinated into error to rethink their position. And that is that, not surprisingly, we have all kinds of conflicting clocks in the same rocks. And here's a powerful example. In the Sierra Nevada granite, the standard way of determining the quote unquote age of the rocks is to use potassium argon dating. So they'll take a rock and they'll measure the amount of potassium and argon in the rock. They know how long it takes for potassium to decay into argon in present day conditions, and then they calculate the age of the rock. So the people living out there in that region are told that the rocks that their houses are built on are between 80 to 120 million years old. But now imagine a second hourglass. And this one has a radium clock in it. Now radium, which is in those very same rocks, has a half-life of only 
1,600 years. That means after 16,000 years, there will not be one particle of radium left in that rock. Now, here's the amazing thing. Radon, the daughter element, only has a half-life of 3.8 days, but it is very dangerous to humans. It is the leading cause of lung cancer for Americans after smoking cigarettes. But people in Sierra Nevada are literally living in homes where they are exposed to levels of radon which are not safe. But the public authorities make no effort to get the people to have their homes tested or to do anything to try to improve the situation because everybody knows that the rocks are actually at least 80 million years old. And after 80 million years, there wouldn't be any radon left in the rocks. So can you see, not only do the conflicting clocks falsify the whole premise that we can determine the age of the rocks and the age of the earth by using these radiometric dating methods, it proves that public authorities are willing to sacrifice your health rather than question the evolutionary mythology. And the most reliable method of radiometric dating is carbon-14 because that can actually be tested against objects that have a known history. And carbon-14 dating has proven that everything, including dinosaur bones in the entire fossil record, contains substantial amounts of carbon-14, which is another total falsification of the evolutionary time scale. And the carbon-14 dates that our team from the Colby Center has gotten for dinosaur bones consistently fall between 20,000 and 30,000 years. And so the critics will say, well, that's still very different from the biblical chronology. And you need to know, no, it's not because the Earth has a magnetic field. It's been measured very carefully for 200 years, and it is decaying exponentially. So if you go back 4,500 years to the time of the flood, the Earth's magnetic field would have been so much stronger than it is now that the cosmic rays would have had great difficulty coming into the atmosphere, colliding with the nitrogen-14 atoms and turning them into carbon-14 atoms so the 20 to 30,000 years that we get for the dinosaur bones can and should be brought down to within the four to 5,000 years of the biblical chronology. That's the logical thing to do. I'm only gonna have time for one last objection, but it is extremely important that I share this one and the answer with you. Why if Lateran IV defined the dogma of creation in a way that excludes theistic evolution and progressive creation, why did traditional theologians at the end of the 19th and the beginning of the 20th century not refer to Lateran IV? This was the biggest headache for us <laughs> for so many years. Because on the one hand, we looked at the greatest commentators over the 600 years from Lateran IV to the beginning of the modernist revolt. And we saw that when they did comment on Lateran IV, they understood that when it defined that God by his own omnipotent power at once simul from the beginning of time created the spiritual and the corporeal creatures and then man, they understood, like St. Lawrence of Brindisi in his commentary, he understood that this meant that God literally created every single kind of plant and animal and every single angel and man at the beginning of time. That's what St. Lawrence of Brindisi and 
Cornelius Alapid and all the greatest commentators held. But they didn't look to Lateran IV as the source of their doctrine of creation because they all believed that the source of the doctrine of creation was, as the Catechism of Trent says, the sacred history of Genesis. So we've had prominent traditional theologians heap scorn upon us for claiming that Lateran IV excludes theistic evolution or progressive creation, creation being spread out over millions or billions of years. Because they say, where are the theologians? Where are the great commentators who refer to Lateran IV? And in one sense, they're right. Because the greatest doctors and commentators did not look to Lateran IV or Vatican I as the source of the dogma of creation. The source was the word of God in the sacred history of Genesis. So we have fallen so far from the heart and mind of the fathers and doctors of the church that we can no longer, even in traditional theological circles, fully comprehend the fact that the angelic doctor and all the fathers and doctors of the church would have literally shed their last drop of blood to defend the proposition that there is not one single error in the entire Bible, whether it speaks of history, geography, the natural world, or anything else. And yet, that is actually the case. So we have to repent of our irreverence, our impiety, and we have to beg God to give us back the heart and mind of our fathers in the faith. But now I have to give you the most powerful argument for any Catholic who has a little piety left in his or her soul. There's only one apparition of the Blessed Virgin Mary that has been fully approved in the entire history of the United States of America. And that was the apparition of Our Lady to an 18-year-old Belgian immigrant, Adele Breeze, in Champion, Wisconsin, which was fully approved by the local ordinary not very long ago. And when Our Blessed Mother appeared to Adele Breeze, it was six weeks before the publication of Darwin's book, Origin of Species. And the Blessed Mother gave Adele a commission, teach the children their catechism, because the area was full of immigrant children who were running around uncatechized. Now, it so happens in God's providence that just a few years before the bishops of the United States in Synod had determined that they would produce an official catechism so that every Catholic in the entire country would learn the doctrines of the faith in exactly the same way, and that was the Baltimore Catechism. So what Adele Breeze used to fulfill the commission given to her by the Queen of Heaven herself was the Baltimore Catechism. Now, the fathers, the bishops of Baltimore in Synod said this catechism is going to be based on the catechism of St. Robert Bellarmine from 1597. So that was the official basis for the Baltimore Catechism. And in St. Robert Bellarmine's catechism, he teaches crystal clear, God created everything in six days. But he also teaches something very, very important in addition. He tells in this catechism that there are many mysteries of God that we may not 
fully understand, but we must believe them. And he says, one of these is the doctrine of creation. But he, sa- but he makes a very import- important comparison. He says, just as in the creation of the world, God, on the third day of creation, willed into existence all the different kinds of plants, flowers, and trees without any prior working of the ground or sowing of seeds. And he says, but we have an analogy because the sacred humanity of our Lord Jesus Christ was created in the same way in the womb of the Blessed Virgin Mary. So what he's doing is he's saying, make your proclamation of the faith coherent. Teach the people that has God acted in the New Testament, that is how he acted in the Old. Do not tell them to believe that God created the sacred humanity of our Lord in a virgin's womb, and then turn around and tell them that science tells us that trees couldn't just pop up out of the ground unless somebody planted a seed because you have destroyed the faith. Now, the Baltimore Catechism teaches crystal clear, God created everything in six days by willing it all into existence, and he did it 6,000 years ago. That was mandated to be taught in every diocese in the entire United States, and it was being taught simultaneously in every diocese in the entire world. And here's the question. Would our Blessed Mother come down from heaven and tell her children to teach a lie? Did our Blessed Mother know how and when God created the heavens and the earth and the seas and all they contain when she appeared to Adele Breeze. Of course she did. She had the beatific vision. She could see in God all the truth, but the truth that she saw in God was the same truth that St. Anne and St. Joachim had taught her when she was a little girl. We are telling our children that the Blessed Mother of God commissioned Adele Breeze to teach a pack of lies to her children about the most fundamental truths of the faith. And we are teaching our children that God himself allowed his church to teach a lie about how he created the world for thousands of years until he finally raised up godless men like Darwin and Heckel and T.H. Huxley so that they could finally enlighten the leadership of God's church so they could finally understand how God really created the world. In the Sermon on the Mount, our Lord asked his disciples, what man is there among you of whom, if his son shall ask bread, will reach him a stone? (laughs) And would our Lord, who is the way, the truth, and the life, allow his church to teach an account of the origin of man and the universe that was not true. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, amen.